Today's Tuesday, May 16th. We've got some really interesting... Wait, what? Uh-oh. Oh, We're getting crypto. It's ransomware. We've been hit by ransomware. What is this? This is not... They don't Are they want... demanding Bitcoin? No. They're de... We will remake The Hobbit without Peter Jackson. Oh. What? I think I know who's behind this. Instead of the boring tech news, we're going to be doing part one of a 37 part series about who's the worst person in the Silmarillion. Now, some people might say it's Fëanor, but I'm going to make a really compelling case for Tuin Tarumbar. Well, also hit with ransomware this week, I don't know how we're going to remake The Hobbit, was the National Health Service in the UK. That's... We're, we didn't, we're not capable of that. We barely, we're, on a, we're on a budget that we can barely do this every week. So, well, uh, yeah, you yeah. said some people were hit by ransomware. Everybody was hit by ransomware. <laughs> Let's see. I think they got hospitals, trains. Um, they got some banks. Airports. Airports. The SWIFT network running Windows Vista might be especially vulnerable. Pretty much globally, there was ransomware, and it was all the same attack. Yeah, it's really it's really sort of interesting. Now, now if I recall correctly, somebody uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure that in like 2014 or 2015, they cut the cybersecurity budget of the NHS by like 5.3 million dollars. So, whoops, yeah, 16, 17 hospitals were affected by this. this is one a cry or one a cryptor, uh, 2.0. Uh, and this is this is a really interesting story. So we actually, like three weeks ago, we were like, this is like DEF CON, solar flare, satellites in orbit, bad. I forget exactly what we said. It was like, you need to patch your systems. Well, apparently those people do not watch this program or listen to this program. Thanks, Patreon members, for making this as a podcast. Uh, so yeah, they got infected and a lot of other stuff got infected too. So these are people that are really, really behind on their patches. And of course, these vulnerabilities are bugs in the software, but bugs that were known to state actors like the NSA that and these <laughs> they knew and it leaked on the internet and now we have this situation. Yeah, this was part of the Shadow Brokers leaked NSA toolkit. So this thing has been out there for well it's not been out there, but it's been known, at yeah. least by the NSA, for a very long time. And Shadow Brokers had it and they were trying to <laughs> ransom it, <laughs> funnily enough. And of course nobody bit, so they released it, they claimed in outrage of Trump. Now, of course, we've still known about it for weeks. Well, when was that? That was like... At least three weeks ago. Early April, they released that. Yeah. But the problem is the things that have been hit here, the hospitals, the trains, the airports and stuff, they notoriously run old operating systems because of the cost of upgrading on you know a, a six or seven year cycle. They're just like, you know what? That would cost billions of dollars. We're just not going to do it. <laughs> so they are susceptible to this kind of thing. What do I even pay those security people for anyway? They're just impersonating Taylor Swift all day on the internet. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's always bad news. They're negative people. Uh, well, this is what you know. having a competent security staff gets you, or at least competent updates. Now, theoretically, in those enterprises, they will have to test every time an update comes out to make sure that it doesn't break anything in their system. And systemically, you know, even maintaining those separate systems for testing, they may not actually do that for cost reasons. Well, you know, now you know why it has to be done with a, a proper and sane architecture. We may actually start to see standards of implementation for things in, you know, the things in computer science sort of stop being the Wild West. More interestingly, because you pay with Bitcoin, we can actually see how many people have paid. And so far, uh, this article says it's 26,000. It's actually up to about 31,000 now. So it's around 120, 130 Bitcoin transactions. And this, this valuation is at the, uh, you know, peak Bitcoin value of just under $2,000. So it would actually be even less money if we go with like, you know, a six month average for the value of, of Bitcoin. I think they ask for 300 per. So I guess that's 300 per system. You got to think what's the average size of the network that was hit. Did they give them the whole network back? I don't, I don't know the details of that. Hmm. Now the thing to think about here, well, there's two very important things to think about here. $300. Yeah, three hundred dollars is what they asked for. I don't know if that like how much does that get you? Is that the whole hospital? I think that I don't know. I'm not sure. So, first of all, the NSA had this for years. Again, it's not a new exploit, and 
it affects these old operating systems so clearly you know they've known about it for a long time so you gotta think about what okay let's say the nsa caught five terrorists using this exploit versus this much global gdp damage <laughs> what's what which the, one is more important the hmm. scales of justice what's more important you know the, the the trains being on time or five terrorists that may or may not have done anything. And the other thing to think about is what are they going to do? You talked about security, right? You know, they're going to rehire all the security people, right? No, <laughs> no. no, they're going to legislate crazy draconian laws based on this. Cause this is real bad. You don't attack the government's money. You don't do it. <laughs> they're going to, the backlash is going to be crazy for this. And, so we're going to get some crazy laws and I expect we're going to get some crazy Bitcoin laws too. Cause they're going to, that's going to be the scapegoat. I think. I think that that's probably true. And, and this is, this might be a first for this program. We're going to like walk back the seriousness of this is like, yes, this is NSA tools. Yes, this is whatever. But honestly, this is sort of a best case, worst case scenario. So these are, you know, state sponsored tools that were, um, I don't want to say developed cause it's not really, like something really super clever. It's it's literally kept just, hidden. yeah kept hidden um, with bugs that were kept hidden and kept from vendors that were really well known. And if you look at like in the U.S., we have something called the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And historically, those guys have been super awesome. And people like the NSA have worked with those guys to develop standards and to offer best practices and security practices. They they I mean they've helped develop security standards. Historically, the NSA and other agencies like the NSA have worked with those guys to try to make the, the playing field better for everybody because somebody somewhere knew what they were doing. And what I mean by that is they realized that the only winning move with this kind of thing is not to play. When you discover these kinds of security issues, you have to make it known. And so I, I don't think the news is really about this specific ransomware and the damage that it has done because honestly, it's really pretty pedestrian. It's really pretty mundane. I think the larger news story here is that people are not going to, I don't think that the people in power are going to learn their lesson that this is the wrong way to operate and a better way to operate is to return to those, you know, like late 1980s standards between the NIST and the, the NSA um, and to try to actually improve the landscape of computer security. Now it's, it's some kind of bizarre game of capture the flag and the casualties in that war are just ordinary businesses and citizens. People taking the train. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's also important to note that this was stopped by accident. Yeah. So this was, it was like a big flare up. And the thing that stopped it is there was one guy, like a security researcher, and he was looking at it. And he noticed that it was phoning home to a domain that wasn't registered. So he was like, okay, let me register this domain and see what happens. Turns out that was the kill switch. Yeah, that was the kill switch. But here's the bad news. It's real easy to take that line out of the code. Yep. There's an They've already done it. Yeah. <laughs> there's no excuse for not installing the updates. You have to install the updates. They've been available for everywhere. Microsoft actually did more testing than they usually do on those updates. So you've got to deploy those updates now. There's even, you can run a PowerShell script and update all your machines in the domain inside of a few hours. So, I mean, honestly, you're going to have to do that versus risk the badness of this malware. Hell, Microsoft's even pushed updates for Windows XP in 2003. That should tell you how bad it is. Yeah, because that's every ATM in the country. Think <laughs> about that. That's XP. <laughs> oh, oh, good. And so uh, another aspect of this that nobody's really talking about is you got to think about this as like a microcosm of things that could go wrong. Imagine this kind of a vulnerability inside operating systems that is still a secret to only a state-sponsored organization. There's no reason to think that the NSA or, you know, the Russian intelligence service or MI6 or whatever uh, doesn't have the same exact kind of vulnerability that is still secret because this one's one of the really old ones. This one goes back, you know, to Windows XP. So keeping that secret from the time of Windows XP to now, not really well, that much of an accomplishment. What was the cutoff on the shadow brokers? It wasn't, they were fairly old, right? Like yeah. a year old at least. Yeah. So they've had a year to catalog more of these things. It's almost guaranteed based on the volume that they had in the shadow brokers dump. They've got something like this that they're still hiding. So that is the, like, if you want to be outraged and you want to do something in terms of activism, focus on that. This is, this is water under the bridge. This is a known quantity. This is not, honestly, this is not really anything to freak out about. I mean, yeah, it's done some damage and that kind of thing. The thing to freak out about is the, um, circumstances that led to this 
are exactly the same today as they were yesterday. There's really nothing that's different. The fixes hopefully will come on the business side of things where these businesses will take steps to make sure they get updates out and that kind of thing. But the updates won't come if the security vulnerabilities are not known to the vendors. And I don't think it's, it is very responsible of our governments to not work with major software vendors if they know that these kind of vulnerabilities exist. And like we talked about, there's going to be a knock-on effect of they're going to take your freedoms. <laughs> you know, it's like 9-11. <laughs> it's like, oh, something bad happened? Well, let's take some freedoms. How is this your fault? <laughs> and I think Bitcoin is going to get hit hard because they're going to say, like, listen, this is the, this is, this funds terrorism and ransomware and it's pure evil. And we've, and it's, it's really making our currencies look bad because look how much it's worth <laughs> compared to our currencies. Uh, how's that happening? And so they're going to strike against it. Now, this is also kind of a parable for the Internet of Things. Imagine that you have a 20-year-old fridge that's still running Windows 2000 because the Internet of Things caught on real early in that parallel universe. There's no patch for Windows 2000. The, the, your Windows 2000 machine could be you know, holding a little old lady for Bitcoin ransom in, in Sausalito. You don't know. I mean, you don't know because it's participating in a bot network. Nobody cares about your 20-year-old fridge. The, the answer is going to be you need to buy another fridge. And this is why maybe we're not really ready for the Internet of Things because we're not ready for pieces of technology that are that long-lived. We don't have the computer science in place to really deal with that. It's a good thing we don't have nuclear subs that are still running Windows 2000. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Oh, wait. We do in the U.S. <laughs> Hmm. Hopefully they don't get infected. <laughs> Send us $300 in Bitcoin or we will destroy Australia. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, talking about the money situation and the impending Bitcoin regulation because people are using it for bad things. I, this story was sort of funny. Yeah, this we threw this in purely because we see the, what's coming with the Bitcoin thing. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, you need to trust the sound American capitalist system. It's a free market. So wait, wait, what are we looking at here? There's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tower in a field surrounded by some shrubberies. I mean, <laughs> did the Knights of Knee have something to do with this? I don't understand. This is, so when you think about the stock market, you think about New York, obviously. The New York Stock Exchange, yada, 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 NASDAQ. But actually most of the hardware is in New Jersey. However, in other parts of the world, like Chicago, they have exchanges. In this case, it's the uh, Chicago Merc Mercantile Exchange, the CME. Now, the question is, when trades happen at the CME, how do you come to New Jersey, right? Do you trust the American ISPs? <laughs> no, <laughs> surely not. So their answer to this is a series of microwave relay towers. You take fiber optic cable out to the yard, and then you just shoot it. And they've got microwave towers every, I guess it's 13 miles. They're not line of sight, are they? I don't know what the distance is on a microwave tower, but it just gets relayed out to... The uh, servers in New Jersey, where the trades get processed. Now, the problem is, I don't think they encrypt this at all. So if you have a microwave station, which is what that picture was that we just showed you, it's a microwave tower, you can actually listen <laughs> to, to what's heading on in what New Jersey. And what we're looking at is a company spent $14 million to buy this little chunk of land outside the CME to get a microwave tower. You think, wow, that's smart. No, it's not. <laughs> Other companies have been doing it before. They're actually, there's a land battle. This plot of land wasn't worth $14 million to anybody. Who would want it? It's just a little piece of land. Well, it turns out all these guys want it. They paid double the market price. What this gains them is one microsecond of a lead <laughs> against the next listening tower, which is a little bit further away. <laughs> and this is what's going on. The high frequency trading they're literally fighting for microseconds to jump in front of the transactions and scalp those pennies. <laughs> and this is totally legal, and everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They had to get a permit to put up a microwave tower. It was immediately granted by Chicago. That's what's going on. In case you're wondering why, you know, why the hell we're talking about this, this is the legit money system, and we mention it yeah. for contrast to the not legit money system of Bitcoin and blockchain. So if you're a commodity investor and you want to buy some uh, hog belly futures, <laughs> your order goes in at the CME and it starts over the microwaves and somebody's like listening to it and they immediately <laughs> jump in front of that order. And their whole business is just jumping in front of those orders and, and scalping pennies off of them. And that's they're making a lot of money. They're making at least $14 million because they spent that on the land. It seems an awful lot like this trading network might be built with bailing wire and duct tape. Yeah. 
<laughs> they do mention in this article that if you moved the set, the microwave transmitter to the roof, it would completely even the playing field, but they won't do that for whatever reason. <laughs> God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Switching back to inter- Internet of Things. Uh, there's a new Internet of Things malware that's targeting 100,000 IP cameras, and uh, it's a pretty strong botnet because, yeah, that's great. Yeah, these are more Chinese cameras. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, Chinese, we give them a bad rap, but every single time it's Chinese cameras. <laughs> well, that's where everything is made. So, yeah. I mean, what do you expect? Oh, that's true. I, don't, I guess they don't make a lot of them in America, do they? <laughs> and it's got a flaw that allows remote execution of code. So, immediately, somebody, as soon as they bought one of those, and they were like, oh, botnet. Yeah, well, I mean, the the reality is that the Americans have sort of forced the Chinese manufacturing sector to make things as cheaply as possible. And so, like, you, you know, if uh, if He Sung's nephew can program, you know, can take a copy of Linux, download it, put it on this camera, and can solve the immediate need for the Americans without any kind of security training or saying, oh, is this secure or is this SQL injection or command injection or whatever, guess what they're going to do because there's really no other option. Also keep in mind that as these new legislations start to be proposed, I, I suspect as early as next week, that, that doesn't mean anything to Chinese manufacturers. <laughs> they don't, I mean, they don't care that whatever freedom crushing thing comes from this, the Chinese, they don't care. They're going to keep making their stuff. and They're going to keep selling it to us. So it doesn't fix anything. Speaking of poorly planned and poorly quality controlled software, let's talk about drivers for HP laptops. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an audio driver, which now this is surprising. I can't imagine why an audio driver would need this. A key logger. <laughs> so apparently the way this audio driver was implemented is it listens for a keystroke to do something with the audio controller. And the way that it implements that is to just log every single key that the uh, keyboard, you know, that somebody <laughs> types in on the keyboard and saves it to a text file for later analysis. I think about how much more work it would be to actually record the keystroke than just to listen for any keystroke. And how much, <laughs> like you had to know that would be resource intensive and eventually... Somebody would be like, why is my hard drive full? So uh, that doesn't make any sense, that argument. It makes perfect sense. I, I mean, he Sung's nephew is only 12 years old. He's, <laughs> he's, he is a prodigy, I'm telling you. He's working well, on both Internet of Things cameras and HP laptop drivers. And he probably was going to get a free laptop to as a prototype to work on. He was going to give it to his girlfriend. No. <laughs> and so he was like, oh, hey, you know what? I'll find out while she's typing. Not just that, but 35 cents an hour on top of that. I mean, good Lord. I mean, it's just... That's great for a 12-year-old. Now, we talked about the the NHS, NHS exploit actually wasn't that bad, but this one really is that bad. <laughs> now, it has been patched, but there were a few days there where this was kind of crazy. Yeah, so there's there's another, another remote code execution vulnerability, this time found by the Google security researchers. And this one has been patched, but it's only a matter of time before we get, you know, munitions-grade malware that is written for this one as well. This thing took advantage of the way that JavaScript is interpreted by the Windows <laughs> Defender Suite. Or that's not, not just Defender, it was the whole thing. What are they, it's the man, something or other? The Malware Protection Service. Yeah, the Malware Protection Service. So this thing, because it was JavaScript based, you didn't have to do anything to get it. You just had to open an email or even a website that had yeah. an ad that was running that JavaScript. Yeah, this is really bad. It's like, oh, there's a file created on the hard drive that contains this magic string. <laughs> Rooted, sounds good. Like, how does this even happen, Microsoft? How does this happen? Now, what do you think the odds are that the uh, NSA already had that one? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. You see what we did there? You, you see what we did? Uh-oh. <laughs> hmm. It's like uh, it's like Pokemon cards for the <laughs> alphabet agency. It's too bad that we can't hire some, some insiders at, like the GCHQ or MI6 or something. To, uh, to help us with this kind of thing, because, I mean, that's sort of the new trend, isn't it? It's like all the things that are illegal in your country, you just hire somebody else from some other country, and, and that, <laughs> that's, that, that works out, right? You just need one little country with no freedoms, and you can just have them do everything. So you, know, you think that would be investigated if we started hiring people from Iran to help us with our, our coding if, problems? If we did it, yes. <laughs> But not the uh, Indian London police. I guess if you're not if you're London police, it's okay to hire Indian hackers to surveil journalists, politicians, and activists. Yeah, journalists, politicians, and activists. Now I'll I'll grant you. Now that we've got the anti-fascist movement, <laughs> sometimes activists can be pretty terrifying, and and you know it's like they're not really 
moving things in a positive direction. But this was, I think it was like Greenpeace. You know, I think they can get violent too. But activists, I mean, I can sort of, not really, but when you say terrorist or pedophile, everybody's like, well, you know, okay. <laughs> We got to stop these people. Okay, well, let's give up some freedom. But politicians and activists, journalists, yeah, especially <laughs> journalists. So the, the the short version of this is that you know the Metropolitan Police Service know that they can't do some of the stuff that they did, so they hired you know international people to do what they can't do. And this may sound crazy, and it may sound like there will be repercussions for this, and maybe there will be. But here in the U.S., we had a case recently where uh, there was a was an Ethiopian expatriate. Something like that. He was he was an activist in Ethiopia who became an American citizen, but kept running his website from America. And so they did exactly the same thing. And the, the judge here in America was like, well, I mean, there's nothing you can do. It originated from outside the country. Yeah. So one wonders if that kind of thing, they looked at this and, and made the same sort of determination. I don't know. But this is really a scary precedent. And at least in America, that we're leaning the same way that this kind of thing is perhaps frowned upon, but actually maybe standard operating procedure. Although as a private citizen, if you were to employ this, you know, you were to spy on an ex-lover or, you know, your employer or something to gain leverage to or, use them for blackmail. Or the government. Or the government. I mean, you'd be locked up forever. Or trapped in a consulate somewhere. <laughs> <sighs> well, we, we mentioned the, uh, uh, the John Oliver go FCC yourself thing and the FCC debate with the Jeep pie. Well, John Oliver, uh, you know, did a TV skit here in America on the uh, on the Daily Show, or no, he, he did a uh, the Last Week Tonight. That's the show. John Oliver used to be on the Daily Show. He's now on his own show, Last Week Tonight, and he mentioned the uh, the FCC thing as well. Now, it was originally covered in 2014, but since we're revisiting all this because we apparently have the memory of a goldfish as a people, um, he told people to go to the FCC website, and the FCC reported that. Attackers attacked the website and took it offline. Not because <laughs> there couldn't possibly be that many people who don't want us to get rid of net neutrality, right? It must be <laughs> that's must impossible. Be a problem now, it is kind of sad that I'm not a big John Oliver fan. It's sad that, like, this we've known about this anti net neutrality thing since like what February, March, yeah. Uh, since, I mean, you know. At least since Trump got into office and put pie, I mean, as soon as he got in there, everybody was like, oh, that's it for net neutrality. And that many people had no idea until John Oliver told them. <laughs> that's the scary part about this story. More people need to subscribe to this podcast. <laughs> or, or just read a headline. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, we don't, we don't invent this news. It's not like we get a call on a red phone. It was like, they're going to destroy net neutrality. We read the, you know, it's public sources. <laughs> no, it's impossible. We make it fun and entertaining by pointing and laughing at how terrible everything is. We have to laugh at it. Otherwise, we get very sad and depressed. Which comes after we, that the camera goes off. <laughs> yeah, we take all the happy pills before going on camera. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> So there's a couple of things with the whole uh, the FCC petition. One, the technical architecture of the thing is terrible. We'll get to that in a second. But two, the articles either talk about the bots that are submitting comments that are pro-net neutrality or the, com the bots that are submitting anti-net neutrality. And I don't think that bots are really submitting the ones that are pro-net neutrality. At least it's not really the same. So there, there, there exists a bot that is submitting real names and addresses in alphabetical order saying, Go a Jeep pie, you do what you need to do. It's got basically canned text. Um, and some journalistic organizations have reached out to those people and said, Hey, did you comment on the FCC website? And so far, the answer has been no. Um, there were also a lot of comments posted that were like death threats and things like that with made up names. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of, you know, just the, the normal internet swill comments that are going to the uh, going to the petition, but there are all or the requests for comments. But there are also thousands and tens of thousands of comments from alphabetically submitted names and addresses of real people saying this is really good. So there is something going on with this form submissions, but I don't buy that it was uh, entirely a denial of service because this happened previously under the previous FCC chairman when the first time that John Oliver called for comments on net neutrality. Yeah, well, you, you should mention that shortly after John Oliver did his little segment, the site went offline and started to behave oddly. Uh, and so you have to wonder, it's like, well, 
what they've said is they were a victim of uh, denial of service attack, of course, because <laughs> if you hated the FCC and what they were doing, you would denial of service them while you wanted people to tell them that they were doing a bad thing. <laughs> But there were submissions both, I mean, there were fake submissions, both pro and con. Uh, and so, you know, we should, if you're, you shouldn't, like, these systems are kind of fragile as it is anyway. But um, a lot of people asked the FCC, it was like, well, wait, this went offline previously, the last time this would happen. And it was not a denial of service attack in 2013 or 2014. How do you know this is a denial of service attack now? And one of the things they said was, well, people are loading the page, but they're not actually doing anything. They're not really navigating from it. They're just sort of loading the page and do, doing that. Well, if you actually go to gofccyourself.com and you actually look at what the web page is doing, there's a lot of really fun, it's, it's not really super robust architecture. So when you go there, you have to do a search for this motion and then click on it, and then that pre-fills a field in a form. The bad news is that that field that's pre-filled in a form happens via Ajax requests. And when I was watching the site when it was really heavily loaded, that Ajax request would never complete. And so when you were on the forum trying to fill out a comment, um, it would never actually go and get the matter that you were commenting on, which was to have been populated by the previous page from the search selection that you did. So yeah, it would look exactly like what they described where it's like somebody just loads the page and sits there because the Ajax request to get the matter ID would never actually complete. So I don't, I don't buy it. Um, there are bots hitting it, of, of course, but Honestly, I don't think that it's a level of traffic that the site should not be able to endure. Now, I have a feeling that the pro net neutrality is outweighing the anti net neutrality, even with the bots, <laughs> because they've also announced that it isn't, this is not a vote. They're not counting pro or against. They're looking for good logical arguments from either side. <laughs> and that it's so they not, can cherry pick. It's not about volume. It's about <laughs> making a good argument. In other words, you're wasting your time. Yeah, there's a, there's a pretty good article from ZDNet talking about some of the uh, fake comments. You can actually go inspect them, which I, I got to applaud this level of transparency where you can actually go and read the comments. You can actually see from the timestamps of the comments that, that names are being submitted alphabetically. And it, because you have to put in your name and address, you know, to comment on it, it is possible for journalists to contact those people and say, hey, did you really post this? And the answer has been no from some of these actual, not not just two bozos on the internet talking about it, but people that will actually call them and, and, and are in a position to do that probably without getting in trouble. Uh, but, you know, I just, there's the, the level of subterfuge here is just crazy. And it's not like the government would totally do that. I mean, they would just totally cover their incompetence by lying. Oh, wait, there's this amazing article on, on Muckruck. Now, this is the CIA. This is not the FCC. But the CIA experienced something similar where they had the Freedom of Information website go up and then it went offline for whatever reason. And if you care to actually read the whole thing here, uh, the problem was their own incompetence and their developer was on vacation. But they never actually, like, they never actually issued any kind of public statement for that. These came out recently, I mean, 2014, these came out recently with a Freedom of Information request. Oops. Yeah, I don't think it really hurt their feelings that Freedom of Information was down for a week. You know? <laughs> oh, oh, we can't get any requests for that? I wonder uh, if I wonder if Ajit Pai is sweating yet with his giant Reese's mug. Well, I'll tell you who's going to be sweating. It's going to be that Comcast engineer <laughs> that didn't shuffle the array of names before he turned on the script. Like, come on, man. Alphabetical? What, really? Uh, alphabetical name submissions? Oh. I mean, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Even the other FCC commissioners are like, hey, wait, uh, you know, Mr. Pie didn't, I I'm, I'm having a hard time filling this, you know, figuring out what's going on. So this article is talking about another FCC commissioner uh, that is asking Ajit Pie, why aren't you listening to yourself? And it's like, wait, what? Yeah, there's a convenient little table here of uh, things that he said in 2014 and things that are inconsistent with his behavior in 2017. So Pi was not always in charge, but he has been at the FCC for a while. And he was there when this 2014, when it, all this started, when they first started talking about net neutrality. And this is funny because the arguments he made in those days were still anti-net neutrality, but because he was the minority, then his arguments were like, we're unelected officials. We can't make these kinds of decisions. Congress, <laughs> Congress should be making these decisions. And, you know, we can't just... We're, we're overreaching our power here. This is not our thing to do. We should leave this alone. We shouldn't be doing this. And every one of those arguments is completely contradictory of what he's doing now. 
<laughs> it's delightful. Did we mention that he used to be a, a lawyer for Verizon? Because, uh, I mean, that just seems like pants on fire dishonest. I think pretty much every one of them has worked for a big telecom, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and John Oliver was right in, in uh, I, you know, I hadn't even realized, but I have watched a few press conferences with Ajit Pai, and people have asked him, "Is like, well, you know, why was there this need for Title II legislation in 2014? What happened? And what happened was Verizon was jacking with the internet traffic, which we, he would have known as a lawyer for Verizon at the time. So uh, that seems problematic that he's like, oh, you know, I really remember why we changed this. That's just, that just seems so blatantly dishonest. <laughs> now you think after the first press conference, too, it's like, oh, that was a tough question. Maybe I should look that up. Yeah. <laughs> nope, nope. <sighs> we can't do we can't go by it every week we don't have a robot this week <laughs> we gotta have a robot ah it's a slow robot week but we do have an uber story <laughs> waymo's case against uber is sent to prosecutors by the judge so this was this is a sort of like a was that wrong should i or shit this was a, like a was that wrong should i not have done that stage well a judge has reviewed it and has sent it to prosecutors to gather evidence now this opens up the possibility for criminal charges and the judge, he didn't make it sound like he definitely thought something wrong was going on. I think he's sort of like, maybe it's, it's over his head. And for once, a judge is willing to admit that. <laughs> so he's like, no, I want federal prosecutors to dig into this and figure out what's going on. But it does, it creates the possibility that Uber could be criminally charged with something for stealing the secrets. Yeah, this will probably affect, uh, <laughs> affect their, their company in, in, in interesting ways. Negatively. If you own the stock, <laughs> probably be bad on Monday. Conversely, I'm kind of surprised that Waymo was not able to present a clear cut and compelling argument that, you know, wrongdoing had actually taken place in a way that a judge could understand. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would expect them to be able to do better than that, but I don't know. In other news this week, Tesla's solar rooftops have gone on sale. Yeah. Or pre order, I guess. Yeah, they've talked about these for a very long time. A lot of people really hyped about these. And now it's finally time you can throw money at them, get your solar roof, get your subsidies. Huh. There's only two styles, apparently, and I don't think it's available in everywhere. But yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll probably be, the pre-orders will probably be filled in like, you know, immediately. Probably by the time you're watching this, they're filled. I am not a big believer in going first generation on something like that. I don't know, for a roof, <laughs> I think I'll wait for 2.0. <laughs> Yeah, that seems definitely like uh, your insurance. It's like something goes wrong. Your insurance company is like, you got a, you got an experimental roof technology, <laughs> yeah. buddy. That's your problem. It's like, but, but, but I want you know a solar rooftop. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, we do kind of have a robot, maybe. I, this is a. I think we should count it as a robot. I mean, it doesn't have any moving parts, but neither did the bank robot. So, <laughs> who will you be angry about though if it chooses to keep you locked up? The Durham AI will help uh, police with custody decisions as to whether or not people should stay in jail or if they're a flight risk. So uh, this is about after you've been arrested. Okay, You've done something wrong, you've been arrested, and now they decide, should you stay arrested? Now, in America, we have the bail system. I'm not sure exactly how it works in the UK. And as a side note, people complain when we say, Europe and we're talking about the UK and they're like they're not in Europe anymore they left the the EU is a financial union it's not the landmass they're still <laughs> European they're still in Europe all right get over it so but this AI is going to decide Down votes incoming yeah. <laughs> this AI is going to decide are you at risk are you going to reoffend in the time that you're waiting for your court date or is it safe to put you back out into the world neat so you can, you know, if somebody gets locked up, would they threaten the AI? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill your family. Yeah. yeah, I remember the Rick and Morty where Rick and Morty was reading the transcripts from that one court case. That was the funny. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just, well, Austria wants in on the whole, let's control the internet thing. So they ruled that Facebook must delete hate postings globally, worldwide, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's not. So hate this is a, a broad definition of hate. I think uh, specifically what they're looking for here is postings that are negative about the Austrian government. <laughs> and they're saying that, okay, Facebook, you might block those postings in all of Austria. That's not enough. 
They must be deleted worldwide. <laughs> Nobody in the world can see anything that we deem as offensive or hate speech. Hmm. Yeah. That can't possibly be abused. That's, uh, and you, so once you give that to Austria, you have to give it to everybody, right? Because <laughs> Facebook is the, the magic land of equality. Well, maybe maybe they're they're starting to realize that that kind of a thing won't work, and they're going to have to solve it on their individual citizens level. Maybe if they forced all the citizens to get some kind of a <laughs> central registration or whatever, they can control it from that end of things. <laughs> so you're saying, as a country, whenever you want to join an online site, you must use a centralized database. Now, of course, nobody would try that. That's <laughs> that's right out of Orwell. That would be nobody would go for that. I think Austria would probably go for it right after Germany gets it working. Oh, Germany. <laughs> So Germany, they want to get, they've, they don't like that having all these passwords, right? That's annoying. <laughs> so the idea is to give you one central account so that when that's compromised, you can get into all the other accounts. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So the government is going to step in and I like how they actually cited Facebook, like login with Facebook is a thing. It's like login with Facebook is so convenient. If only we had that at a uh, governmental level. It would be just so convenient for everybody and also so easy to track somebody across all of their devices, IP addresses, and internet connections. They're talking about banking websites, insurance websites, Mercedes is in on it. <laughs> I'm sure that all the social media will have to get on board with that in Germany. <laughs> They'll make it a law. <laughs> and uh, that's really terrifying that there's going to be, and it's going to be run by the government. So, of course, it's, <laughs> the security is going to be top notch, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, so what you're telling me is that Tad from National Security Services will be able to log on as you and just delete those Facebook postings for you? Yeah, I mean, he'll certainly be reading them. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound like that could possibly end badly either. Mm. <laughs> well, switching gears a little bit to technology news, uh, the NVIDIA Tesla V100 is the first Volta GPU, and it's one of the largest pieces of silicon ever. So this is a new GPU. It's sort of, it's it's really just an announcement, but I mean... That is an insanely huge piece of silicon. Look at that. It's just completely nuts. 21 billion transistors. That's just, it's mind blowing that there are 21 billion individual items on that little die. The, the, the working can be controlled. Don't get excited though. This is not a gaming GPU. <laughs> no, not, not even close. Yeah, you're not going to be getting any Counter-Strike frames from this thing. This thing, I mean, architecturally and, and the level of complexity and, and what we're dealing with here in terms of, like, uh, performance, I mean, the, you know, uh, 15 teraflops on floating point 32, 30 teraflops for floating point 16, seven and a half teraflops at 64 bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's designed for, for number crunching and TensorFlow, which is, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, but it's still an insanely, insanely huge piece of silicon. There's not going to be a, a terrific yield rate with these. It's going to be a long time before something like this is really shrunk and usable by the consumer without really um, cutting out a lot of the complexity. But with things like TensorFlow, um, I don't know that those, are, that those kinds of tasks will ever really be meant for the consumer anyway. If you want one of these, the only way to get it is to buy the NVIDIA server, and that'll start you at 150 grand. Yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, things like yield rate, uh, doesn't really matter. It's going to be a real healthy margin. I think NVIDIA reported record record uh, profits last quarter. So NVIDIA is on a roll. It's going to be really neat. This is also a sort of a case study into why um, stacking silicon is going to have to come in vogue because you don't want to try to put everything on one because, you know, any one little defect in one little part of it may render the whole thing unusable. But if you can put together a whole bunch of little pieces and literally stack it directly on the silicon then you don't have to worry as much about interconnects or taking the silicon and breaking it out into a circuit board and then stuffing it back in silicon, those kinds of things. So this is like layered silicon, die stacking, those kinds of things are going to come in vogue when we're talking about systems that are this complex. Uh, I don't like to cover leaks, but yeah, leaks. <laughs> Specifications of the Core X i9? Wait, i9? <laughs> now how much of i don't know when they made the decision but how much do you think of i9 decision was made up of amd copying the 357 <laughs> so i think that the i9 was originally going to be released when so like amd released the eight core bulldozer and if that cpu had been much better i think intel planned to release i9 but here we are finally with ryzen an actual honest to god amazing eight core cpu for you know, an insanely cheap price. And so Intel's like, it's finally time to roll out the i9. Yes. Yeah. We sort of wondered, is 
What's Intel's response to this going to be? Are they going to drop their prices and get in there and fight down in the mud? Or are they just going to like go, you know, ivory tower and be like, yeah, that's fine, peasants. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this 12 core, 4.5 gigahertz. You don't have anything like that, do you? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, so the i7-920X, which is probably not going to be out until August now. Take all this with a grain of salt. This might not be accurate at all. This is all based on a screen cap of a slide, so who knows. Uh, we'll probably know sometime around Computex, maybe right after Computex. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. A lot of stuff's going to come out at Computex this year. Jesus. But, um, yeah, 10 core, 20 core, uh, 10 core, 20 thread part, 3.3 gigahertz up to you know 4.3, maybe 4.5 on a limited number of cores. They're going to try to push all this for June, which is really surprising because Intel was originally slated to launch all of this stuff um, sort of the last quarter, you know, Q3, Q4 of 2017. So I don't know if this is just going to be an announcement or if there's actually going to be general availability of these parts. If there is general availability of these parts, that is going to be really surprising. That, this is really going to reignite the red versus blue war because now we are going to have an honest to God reason for the Intel fanboys to be like, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, you, you, your cheap crap is nice. Oh, it's wonderful for the plebs. But look at these monsters. Only we can have these monsters. I also want to call attention to these. Like, there's two i7s in this lineup. So this is, you know, this has obviously got to be a new socket, 2066 or so, rumor would have it. And there's four core, eight thread. And, and there's an i7 that's four cores and four threads with six megs of cache. What is this CPU? Is this CPU for people that can't afford a good CPU and they're just waiting to get something reasonable? Why would you put a four core, four thread on this socket? It makes no sense. Even at those clock speeds, you would have no reason to buy that over Ryzen. I can't imagine. That's Plus, nuts. Especially because you're going to have to buy a new motherboard. Yeah. It's going to have to be a brand new set. You're going to have to deal with the, the early adoption crap. Mm hmm. And Ryzen's going to be well established by then. That's yeah, that's crazy. I don't know what they're thinking with that one. The other thing too here is the PCIe lanes. You know, 44 lanes at the top end, 28 in the middle of the road, and 16 at the low end. Between for X99, you know, with the 28 to 40 PCI Express lanes, that was already kind of a headache for vendors. I mean, you're, you're talking about putting PCI Express switches or PLX bridges, or you know, different vendors sort of dealt with that in interesting ways. And that's one reason that um, X99 motherboards were so expensive. I mean, it was so hard to find an X99 motherboard that was any good around a $200 price point. Well, this is moving from socket 2011 V3 to socket 2066 or something with a lot of pins, a lot more complexity. So out the gate, minimally, you know, even if Intel wants to compete price-wise, they're going to have to make up the margin on volume because the stuff, like, if you, it's like AMD's got, like, micro pin grid array, two channels of memory, you know, 24 PCI Express lanes total. And just the whole cost of the platform is way less than the complexity that you're going to have to deal with this thing. And so now with three sets of PCI Express lanes, that's going to be a huge headache for motherboard vendors to try to deal with. So I just can't imagine that we're going to see motherboards or this chipset that are around the sort of magical 200-ish dollar price point for a motherboard. So, I mean... And will Intel lower the prices on CPU? Maybe a little, but, you know, is this 12 core, 24 thread, is this still going to be $1,700? Because if it is, I just, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that anyone will care. Especially if AMD is going to release some of their own enthusiast chips. <laughs> AMD strikes back. This is like watching Star Wars, I guess. I don't know. These are, these are, so, you know, you guys know about Naples, which is AMD's server platform. And so there maybe are some desktop CPUs that are coming for the Naples platform. And so we're talking about 16 core, 32 thread CPUs that clock up to 3.6 gigahertz. Yeah, and it's attractive, but after looking at the previously, <laughs> the clock speeds. Four and a half gigahertz. Yeah, uh, yeah, they do disappoint a little bit when you compare them without thinking about any kind of monetary value <laughs> against the Intel juggernaut. <laughs> this one is going to be six hundred dollars. No, I don't know. There's no no pricing or nothing that's that's really been announced. But uh, the the uh, Naples server platform, there's no details or anything like that. Might you know some of these might be quad channel, might even be eight channel memory in in the, in the server side of things. So uh, you know it's really time will tell. We should know in a few weeks. It's going to be really really interesting. Also, as a quick follow up from last week, Windows 10 ARM is actually less locked down than Windows 10 S. <laughs> It's, Windows 10 S has gotten a lot of bad press. S stands for stupid. 
because of the app store and being locked down. And actually, I think we we have a correction from last week. I forgot. We said there was going to be Chrome, but there isn't. No, there's no Chrome. Yeah. Chrome is the the rule is you can have a browser on the app store, but you have to use Microsoft's render engine. Hmm. So, and Google's like, no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but the ARM version of Windows will run x86 and emulation, and you can install all the old programs. Huh. Wow. That's just really like that's just that's just underhanded. That sounds like an antitrust thing waiting for <laughs> for stuff. Somebody uh, there was somebody pointed somebody pointed out that Chromebooks are kind of the same thing. It's like you know, Chromebooks can only run Chrome store apps and whatever. And say, I got Crouton, so. I guess I could could install regular Windows on for yeah. Windows 10 S. So. Well, I mean, there's always going to be a workaround. I, yeah, well, I've always, a lot of people, again, this is red versus blue. Google is not the savior from Microsoft. <laughs> you know, yeah. Google is terrible. Yeah. Uh, we, you shouldn't look to them as the future. <laughs> They're awful. But that doesn't mean that it's okay for Microsoft to do this kind of thing. <laughs> A Windows. I just can't get over a Windows laptop that doesn't run Windows applications. I mean, <laughs> what a time to be alive! <laughs> Can you imagine that boardroom? It's like, okay, well, Bob, could you explain that again? What's the plan for Windows? It's like, okay, yeah, you know those Windows applications? We're not going to run them. <laughs> uh, well, Apple has become the first U.S. company to top an eight hundred billion dollar valuation. That's. Uh, I think when the anthropologists look back. On this time in history, <laughs> this will be like one of them. Like when when they show the chart of the decline, this will be very near the top. It's like <laughs> here's where Apple became the first company in the world, or first American company to make under 800 billion valuation, and then just a sharp decline. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, if the mindset of people change, there is nothing that will keep them shackled to the Apple ecosystem. Like it's literally just a psychological thing. But it's so powerful. <laughs> now, this is talking about pure valuation. So the stock price is a big part of this. If they lose a bunch of their stock price, it'll drop back under. Uh, but it seems like the stock's going up because people expect the new iPhone to sell really well. However, we should also mention that uh, Apple is not one of these companies that's like rich with stocks. They have so much cash. Yeah. They've got every kind of money. <laughs> They've probably got Bitcoin. They've got all the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally all the money. <laughs> I wonder how much longer before the U.S. government starts appropriating Apple's cash to just keep running. Yeah. Did you see the... <laughs> it's going to happen one way or the other. <laughs> did you see in Venezuela where I think it was a Ford plant or a GM plant? And he was just like, we're taking this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the American government's like, Apple's ours. <laughs> it's going to happen. Uh, but of course, all the manufacturing stuff's in China, so... Oh, yeah. Well, I said it didn't matter too much. Amazon is apparently popular among teens? What? Yeah, this is weird. So they, they ranked... How apps that teens love, because you know teens. That's you want to advertise to teens, because that's where the money is. And in five years, that's really where the money is. You got to get them young. That's how it works. So you would think like Snapchat, right? Instagram, uh, Facebook. I don't know where Facebook lands in there. No, it's Amazon. They just want to shop. They're just buying crap on Amazon. Yeah, teen, mm. teens just love to shop. I guess. Well, that'll be good for Amazon's bottom line, because everybody will just buy everything through Amazon. I mean. I have to admit that buying groceries and, and toiletries and things that you normally have to go outside to buy, you just get on Amazon. It's, yeah. it's kind of great. You, sometimes I do. I just like to embrace <laughs> the, like, I know that this is destroying the world and the economy and we shouldn't let them get this much power, but it's so convenient and so delicious. <laughs> Somebody will just bring me my stuff. How cool is that? And that's how I feel about Nestle water. <laughs> It's so delicious. I don't care if they're taking it from wherever. You know, to take more of it. It's so good. Yeah, it could be less expensive, that's for sure. It is good, though. It's like reverse osmosis glacier yeah, water or something. It's real pure. Yeah. <laughs> well, Germany has just smashed the uh, energy record, generating 85% of its electricity needs from renewable energy. So this is not just residential. This is also commercial energy as well. Pretty impressive. Um, of course, you know, it's a fairly small in comparison, and you have a lot of, uh, what's their, their population density is pretty high, right? Yeah. So you got a lot of people packed together. I don't know if America could ever adapt to this kind of thing. Well, Germany has a lot of manufacturing and a lot of, like, electrical needs. I mean, there have been other headlines that, like, you know, 100% of the need for residences, you know, residences and whatever has been generated by whatever. But they always leave out the commercial need for electricity because commercial needs for electricity are many, many, many times higher 
than the residential needs in a lot of cases. And this is, is really impressive because Germany generated 85% of everything that it needed from renewables. Yeah, it's funny because it's like this, you know, they got their reputation for, you know, like this uh, just pure motivation toward efficiency. And it's like, well, let's just aim that toward the green stuff, right? And they're like, okay, we will do it. And here they are. <laughs> if only we could do that in America. We're too worried about who's going to pay war prices for internet to actually worry about things that matter. <laughs> well, it would require taking some of that bombing budget <laughs> and moving it towards something else. Like science or research, <laughs> not bombing. <laughs> well, science and research is fine, as long as it's bombing science and research. <laughs> oh, right. My bad. I forgot. Now, this is, you know, we, we, we added this story, and I don't know what to make of this story. This is another one of those stories that if I think about it too long, blood's going to shoot out of my nose. <laughs> so, there's an election coming up in the UK, which is part of Europe. <laughs> and For the moment, at least. <laughs> Somebody's watching this in 2022 is like, nah, -uh, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and Theresa May, you know, she's, she's doing the tours. She's doing her last-minute campaigning. And one of the th promises she's making is to crack down on that filthy social media. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm sensing a double standard here. Didn't we have a story last week about a politician who said the internet didn't matter? <laughs> and you don't even need to use the internet? Now, the argument was that if you were mad about being spied upon by your ISP, just don't use the internet. Hmm. But in this case, if you're mad that someone called you a name... We must crush them. <laughs> we need to regulate social media and all this other <laughs> stuff on the internet because, yeah, this seems, I mean, uh, it's, it, this seems like a dangerous double standard. Now, that is, that one of those was in America and one was in Europe, <laughs> of which UK is the, a part of. Uh, but we have the same kind of thing going on here where they're talking about, you know, it's like Facebook needs to be more responsible. They're showing these killings. We got to have, you know, oversight to all these things. So it is that crazy double standard of, if, if we make a ruling you don't like about the internet, just shut up and go away. But if somebody calls you a bad name, oh, God forbid a racist name, then we got to get in there and protect you. Well, you know, in this context, I do have to say that somebody telling other, somebody else to not take the internet too seriously, it doesn't matter, uh, seems like good advice. But taking the internet so seriously that you have to encumber it with ridiculous reg regulation uh, for just, you know, internet trolls, I... I mean, come on. <laughs> and there, there is no politician. I, I will give you this, this personal guarantee right now. There is no politician that can make everybody on the Internet happy. <laughs> there is no politician that can make everybody in the YouTube comment thread for this video happy. <laughs> so certainly no way you can extrapolate that into the entire population. It's just not possible. Usually our like-dislike ratio really is amazing. It's but... going to be worse because I've made the Euro <laughs> comments. Though. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. Sorry. So it... <laughs> It, it totally doesn't matter. I guess it's, it's completely fine. Um, I do like the idea of sort of uh, not making special laws for things that happen on the Internet. So if you're in a situation where, you know, uh, you have a troll that's really stirring up a lot of hate and they're really, you know, target, you know, it's like, oh, here's this politician's home phone number and where their kids go to school and crap like that. But it turns out harassment and stalking and things like that are still illegal. Just yeah. you don't need a special law because harassment what, with a computer. What if they were taking that same information and just stapling it to telephone poles, right? But it should apply the same way. Yeah, it's it's not where it's taking place. It's what it is. Yeah, and the, the whole it's like oh they did it with a computer. It's fifty times worse. That is dumb, and we must fight that dumbness because dumbness is bad. Now we usually do a happy story at the end of the news. Could we try to find something? Pleasant to count. I mean, it was pretty much all bad this week. <laughs> there was those solar panels. That, that was nice. Unfortunately, this week, we don't have a happy story. We have a terribly depressing story. <laughs> Pepe the Frog's creator kills him off because he was co-opted by white supremacists? Feels bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so apparently uh, white... I don't know. Not really. I it think was just the trolls. Really. It was poll the poll group on 4chan. <laughs> let's say let's call them what they are here. That was them. They they embraced Pepe as part of the Trump thing, and they purposely turned him into a white supremacist symbol to make fun of the media that they would bite onto it. And, and they did. 
boy, was this a win for them. <laughs> Played them like a fiddle, I would say. So the creator, Pepe was actually part of a, a cartoon thing. I didn't know that until like very recently. He was furious about this kind of thing, and so he has officially killed Pepe off in the comic strip. Wow. So no more Pepe. I wonder, though. I mean, they've killed Batman. They've killed Superman. And <laughs> they've killed Aquaman. I think he's coming back. He's definitely going to continue to live on in the fan fiction film, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, think he's, I think that outshined the original a long time ago. But rest in peace, Pepe. You will be missed. You will be no. sorely missed. <laughs> That's pretty much it for the news. Oh, my goodness. What will you do until next week? I know. Go back and rewatch all the Level 1 videos. It's great. Or just continually submit things to that FCC <laughs> use real names and stuff though like you know maybe you could use your family or something just go through the phone book <laughs> alphabetically no somebody already beat you to that <laughs> you need to contact all your friends and be like do you want this i don't know we didn't mention it but there was actually a uh, the cable lobby did a poll on net neutrality and and it's really funny because the way that they worded the questions uh, you know somebody that wasn't read in on, on the code language that they were using on the questions uh they would say oh yeah i should totally support what a Pie is trying to do but um, the, the people that they, that they did the poll for were smart enough to see through it. Some of the questions was like, hey, do you think that blah, blah, blah should happen where blah, blah, blah was the stuff that Title II protects? And the people were like, yeah, that should be, you know, that, that should be a thing. Um, and so the cable industry lobby did not really use that poll anywhere, but some journalists got a hold of it. I just think it's kind of funny that it's like, oh, we tried to word the poll questions in such a way that it would be pro- what a Jeep pie wants to do, but in reality, people still want, you know, the Title II type protections for the traffic that run over, you know, uh, uh, common carriers. Whoever came up with that poll will be beaten. Yeah, they'll pro probably fired, maybe disappeared, maybe put in a vat of acid. I mean, that's how serious these people They're are. They're going to be skinned, <laughs> and a Jeep pie is going to use their that, that skin to reupholster his furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Not even two liters of coffee from his giant Reese mug will console him. <laughs> uh, see you next week. See ya.